All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, Marie. Hi, Carol. How are y'all? So glad that you all could join um, this live stream. This, hi, Bree. Congratulations, Bree. I'm so proud of you and so happy for you. Bree passed her nurse aid certification exam. Yay, Bree. Congratulations. So this, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here, okay? This, I'm so excited because this is um, actually my first live stream. You're welcome, Bree. My first live stream and my first video uh, dedicated to instructor coaching. Now, don't start dropping off, right? Because if you are a nurse aide student, Right, you could actually benefit from some of this information that um, I'm going to be disseminating to you all. Right, I think that as a student, you will gain a better understanding of some of the frustrations um, and challenges that we as nurse educators or nurse aid instructors um, are confronted with on a daily basis. Right when we're trying to uh, give you, um, you know, top-notch quality instruction, right? So if you're a student, stay around. You can stay around and listen to this live stream. If you are a nurse aide instructor, definitely, definitely stay around, okay? Stick around. Hey, Carol, congratulations. Yay. We got some new certified nurse aides up in this live stream. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I like to hear. All right, guys. So in this um, nurse aid instructor coaching live stream, what I want to focus on in this video are um, is three questions that um, I get asked a lot by instructors and not just novice instructors, but intermediate and um, experienced instructors, okay? And those two, three questions are one, how can I get and keep my students engaged in training? Two, how can I eliminate those daggone cell phones, right? Especially um, during lecture. And three, how can I eliminate that sidebar chatter, okay, during lecture and lab, all right? So tonight in this video, I'm going to take on the latter two questions, okay? How can um, instructors in eliminate both cell phone usage during training um, and sidebar chatter, okay? Um, how to get and keep your students engaged. That's going to be a, a coaching video um, of its own, okay? But I want you to keep in mind that um, the getting your students engaged and keeping them engaged uh, requires two different skills, okay? Or two different, um, you know, techniques or tips, right? However, the getting your students engaged has a lot to do with what we're gonna be talking about tonight, okay? All right, so if you all have any questions during this live stream, uh, go ahead and type them in the comment section um, or the chat box, right? Whatever y'all wanna call it, right? If you are uh, watching, gonna watch this live stream later after it processes, um, and if you have any questions, you can go ahead and again, type it in the comments section or the chat area, okay, of this video. All right, guys, so, um, so how can you eliminate cell phone usage and sidebar chatter? You can't, okay? You can't. And as nurse aid instructors, right, nurse, nurse educators, as instructors, trainers, and teachers, I want you all to 
think about, really think about those questions, okay? And when you're thinking about those questions, I want you to think about when we have to go through all the trainings that we have to go through, not just as nurses, but also as teachers and trainers and instructors, right? And sometimes, uh, you know, it's usually in the form of, of a conference, right? So we have to go to all of these conferences that last anywhere from one hour to all day, right? One hour to all day. Let me tell you, I know a lot of y'all will agree with me that those all day um, conferences are very challenging, right? Especially if they're in Austin, right? We have to drive to Austin or we have to drive to Dallas, right? Um, you know, it's gonna take us an hour, hour and a half to get to Austin, right? And then we gotta be there uh, for six hours and then another hour, hour and a half to get back, right? So a very tiring day uh, for, you know, as our educators when we do have to, you know, actually do our training right? But I want you to think, think back the last time you were at one of these uh, trainings or conferences, right? Um, and you scan the room, right? And when you scan the room, what do you see people doing? You see people doing this on their phone, right? And you might be one of those folks. I know I am. I know I am. I have no shame in my game, right? Some of those conferences can be extremely boring and I will get on my cell phone, I'll check my email or I'll check to see, you know, my text, respond to emails, respond to texts. I may even jump on Facebook or IG just to see what's going on during these conferences, right? Um, so I may even, the person sitting next to me, right, I may pick up a conversation with that person. So if we can't do it, listen up now, if we as instructors cannot eliminate ourselves from using cell phones or, you know, um, you know, not sidebar chatter uh, with someone sitting next to us or in the row in front of us or the row behind us, how do you expect to eliminate that from your students? You can't, okay, you can't, right? And so this is where we actually get into classroom guidelines, all right? So um, you have classroom rules and you have classroom guidelines. Now you probably think that they're one and the same, but they're not, okay? Um, you have to you have to realize what the first of all rules has a different definition than guidelines okay so when you look at a rule a rule is basically a law or a regulation right and there are so many laws and regulations in America. There are so many laws and regulations in nursing, right? So many laws and regulations with NATSAPs, right? These laws have been in place for many, many years, okay? Many years. Just think of when OBRA came about in 1987 has regulations for OBRA changed? Think about it, since 1987, right? It's a federal law, right? It's a federal act or a federal law. Okay, since 1987, there has been no adjustments, no modifications to OBRA, okay? So I want you all to think, right? So a guideline, on the other hand, is more non-specific than a rule is, okay? Um, a guideline is more of um, a principle that provides direction, okay, to certain actions or behaviors, right? So I don't know about you, okay, but even right now as an adult, if I had an instructor or a trainer 
tell me that, hey, before we get started with this training, these are my classroom rules. And the first thing that I'm going to start thinking is, hmm, one, how can I break that rule? Okay. And two, how many times, how many times can I break that rule and get away with it? Right. Okay. So how can I break that rule? And how many times can I break that rule and get away with it? Right. So now you've already set yourself up as an instructor for failure when it comes to cell phone usage and sidebar chatter. And again, I want you to think back the last time you were at training or at a conference, right? You scan the room. What did you see most people doing? I'm not gonna say most, maybe like two handfuls of people doing, maybe even yourself, right? I've been at conferences where I have seen people get up, okay, with their, their phone like this and walking out of the conference, okay? All right? Um, so I want you to think about that, okay? And then ask yourself, can I really eliminate this from my classroom? Boom, no, you can't, okay? No, you can't. Can you do it with classroom rules? Um, with rules, it's gonna still be challenging because remember when, especially when you're dealing with high schoolers, right? Um, and, and not even really with just high schoolers because I really don't see a difference in behaviors when it comes to adult learners and, and high school learners. I really don't, I've, I've taught both, okay? And it's the same. Sometimes I think adult learners are worse, right? Just because they are adults and you're an adult, we're equal, right? We're equal. However, sometimes those adult learners cannot separate that equalness from being in the classroom and being out, right? In the classroom, we're not equal. I'm your supervisor, I'm your instructor, so we're not equal in a sense. But once I step out that door, once we both step out that door, now we are equal because we are both adults. So sometimes I think that it's harder for adult learners to actually um, be able to, um, you know, connect with, um, you know, instructors that may be younger than them, right, telling them what their expectations are as far as classroom behaviors, right? But again, like I said, when you title your expectations as rules, um, that may cause your students to try to challenge those rules, whether they're high school students or adults. So what I like to do is, I like to use guidelines, classroom guidelines, okay? And I use a democratic approach uh, when I'm creating my guidelines, okay? So, there are three parts, three parts to uh, the development of your classroom guidelines, okay? The first is that you have to create them, right? The second is that you have to implement them. And the third element, okay, of classroom guidelines is you have to enforce them, okay? Because it defeats the purpose if you create a guideline and you really don't implement them. And it defeats the purpose if you create and you implement, but you don't enforce them. So it, that defeats the purpose, okay? And then you sit and wonder, why are my kids still having these behaviors? Because a lot of times, um, you know, you ignore those behaviors that you put in place, okay? So, Let's talk about these guidelines and I'm gonna tell you how you can set up your guidelines. So first you wanna think about, um, you know, the you know, specific behaviors that you normally see your students um, exhibit, okay? And I know 
My number one challenge is with the cell phones, okay? Um, number two challenge is with the sidebar chatter. When I say sidebar chatter, I'm talking about a full-blown conversation, okay? Um, and with your students engaging in their cell phones or with their cell phones or engaging uh, with, you know, the student that's sitting next to them with, a full-blown conversation, they're going to be missing a lot of important information that you are, um, you know, teaching them, instructing them on, right? Es especially during lecture, okay? So the first, the first important variable when it comes to uh, classroom guidelines versus classroom rules don't title it classroom rules, okay? Get get rule out your head, okay? No more rules. Has to be guidelines, okay? Um, and why guidelines? Guidelines are set in place to be reviewed periodically, right? And modified, whereas laws aren't, okay? Remember, we have laws that were put in place by Congress hundreds of years ago. And those laws are still the same. Nothing has changed. The only time a law changes is if something happens and then bam, you know, it's a court case now, right? All the way up to the Supreme Court. And depending on what the Supreme Court judges decide will determine whether or not that law gets modified, right? I'm, I'm right. Am I right or wrong, right? Now with guidelines, Again, like I, I just said a few seconds ago, guidelines were made to be periodically reviewed, okay, and updated or modified, right? Okay, so the first thing is that you want to title um, your behavior expectations as classroom guidelines and not classroom rules, okay? So I'm going to type this in here, classroom guidelines, not, not classroom rules, okay? So classroom guidelines, not classroom rules, okay? Now, the second, um, the second key element to have successful guidelines in your classroom is to not negate the guidelines right? So no negation. So basically what I'm saying is that, um, you know, in your guidelines, you don't want to put um, cell phones prohibited or no cell phones, right? You want to leave that negative out of your guidelines, okay? And why? Because remember, guidelines are like principles, right? Uh, that, that guide certain actions or gives directions to certain actions or behaviors, okay? Oh, guys, I'm sorry, hold on a sec. All right, so gives gu guidance or directions to certain, um, you know, actions or behaviors that your students um, may uh, have the probability of exhibiting during class, right? And you don't want that, right? Um, so instead of saying, no cell phones, okay, no cell phone usage, right? You could actually have a guideline that says, um, you know, cell phone usage limited to, um, you know, five minutes, you know, after lecture, I mean, five minutes before lecture, right? So, you know, you're gonna be, you know, when students start coming in, um, you have at least 10 or 15 minutes where you're taking role or you're doing whatever. If you're in the, um, you know, uh, the school system, the bell rings, um, you know, you're, it's going to take you about five or 10 minutes uh, to get situated, you know, students to sign in on the state sign in log. Um, and then you have to take, you know, classroom attendance um, for that period, right? And the same thing for adult learners, okay? Uh, you know, they come in and they sign in on that sign-in log. If they have homework to turn in, they're turning in their homework, they're getting situated. So you can actually use that time 
as cell phone usage time, right? There's no negation. Um, you're just saying, hey, look, this is my guideline. A cell phone usage is limited to, you know, five minutes before uh, the start of lecture or five minutes before the start of lab, okay? And then you remember, you got to give direction or guidance, right? So I always tell my students the most important question you can ask during training is why. Okay, why? W-H-Y, because that will help you get a better understanding of why you're doing what you're doing or why your instructor is, um, you know, uh, training you uh, to perform a step a certain way or why this information that we're giving to you is important. Why you should do what you do, when you do it, and how you do it as a nurse aide. That is the most important question. So when it comes to your guideline, you want to go ahead and answer that question, right? So cell phone usage limited to, uh, you know, five minutes before, um, you know, lecture or before lab to give you, the student, a greater opportunity for gaining a better sound understanding of you know, lecture information, right? So now the students are putting two and two together, okay? They're not saying, you know, they're not gonna be thinking, oh my gosh, my teacher is a czar, you know? Um, you know, this is their rule and they're not gonna change that rule, right? Instead, they're gonna be like, oh, well, you know what? We can use our phone for five minutes before lecture, right? And then once you start talking, they know to put that phone away. And the reason why you want them to put that cell phone away is because for their benefit, right, for them to be able to gain a better understanding of what you are teaching them. Okay, are y'all following me? All right. So, so um, if you're a student, that is why we do not, as instructors, do not like or appreciate you being on your cell phone while we're training because we know that you are distracted and you're not listening to what, uh, you know, the information that, um, you know, we're, we're teaching you on, you're interested and focused and engaged on whatever it is you're doing on your phone. So that is why, okay, we put a lot of emphasis on, you know, limiting cell phone usage, right? So remember, as instructors, we're not telling our students, no, you cannot get on your cell phones. What we're saying is cell phone usage is limited, okay? Or even you can even um, do like in the middle of lecture, let's say you have an hour long lecture, okay? So you give your students, you already know your students are gonna be on, your, on their cell phones, right? Um, at the beginning of class when you're taking attendance and they're signing in, right? We already know that, okay? But let's say somewhere in the middle, okay? You have an hour long lecture, let's say, you know, 10, 15 minutes is taken away from that in the beginning for attendance and everybody getting settled in. So really like a 45 minute lecture, right? So let's say, Halfway through that lecture, let's say at the 20 minute mark, um, you can allow um, like a brain break, right? And in that brain break, students can get up, they can go to the bathroom, they can get some water, they can get on their cell phone, right? You give that five minutes. So you can even tailor your classroom guidelines to integrate cell phone usage during lecture because we already know they're going to be on it. They're going to be sneaking. They're going to be doing like this, right? And I can always tell because they're like this and then they look up and down and then they look up, right? So give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Or not the benefit of the doubt, but give them the opportunity to really take in what you are teaching. Give them some leverage, okay? Give them some leverage to use their cell phone. Let them know, hey, it's okay you, to use your cell phone during brain break time, 
for, you know, the first five minutes before lecture, because I can tell you a 45 minute lecture, hour lecture, students start getting antsy, especially your kinesthetic learners. OK, they get they get antsy. Kinesthetic le uh, learners get antsy right within the first 10, 15 minutes of a lecture. Right. Especially if you don't have any type of um, interactive activity to go along with that lecture, right? Okay, and now when it comes to sidebar chatter, you can do the same thing, okay? Again, uh, give them that five minute, 10 minute brain break in the midst of your lecture. That way, again, they can get up, they can talk, they can get on their phone, they can do whatever they need, or better yet, Give them an interactive activity that they can do, right? Um, to where that sidebar chatter is geared towards that activity, okay? And they're actually learning, all right? Okay, um, let's see. All right, congratulations, Erin, on starting your training. Oh, good, I'm glad. Okay, um, Aaron, Aaron has asked a really, really good question. Aaron has asked, um, she's wondering how long should she wait or not wait to get ready to take your state exam? Um, Aaron, you start getting ready to take your state exam day one of training. Okay. Day one of training is when you start getting prepared to take your state exam. Day one. Don't forget that, folks. Day one. Instructors, don't forget that, right? Because a lot of what we do, um, you know, that's what our, the nurse aid training program has two goals. One um, is to give you a basic foundation of being a nurse aide, and two, uh, which I think trumps that foundation, okay, and I'm sure there are some instructors that may disagree, but two is uh, to get to prepare you uh, to take your nurse aide certification exam. And why do I say the latter trumps uh, the earlier, right? I think that preparing the student to get their state certification trumps uh, you know, giving students that basic foundation uh, to becoming a nurse aide is because they got to pass the test, first of all, right? They have to pass the test to become a nurse aide, right? And so that foundation that we, we give to you during training um, is not going to do you any good if you're not prepared to take your exam and you go to, you know, on test day, you fail, right? So I'm sure a lot of instructors may disagree with me, but, you know, while we are preparing you for your exam, we're still actually giving you that foundation. And you have to understand that that foundation is during lecture, okay? During lecture, when, you're, when your instructors are lecturing you, that is what you will do or how you will do things in real life, okay? Lecture, so it's very important, okay? And then when they have lab with those lectures that correlate with those lectures, again, that's how you do things in real life, okay? Then you have another lab, right? Or should have another lab where this is how you are required to perform certain actions during testing, right? Because each authorized administrator has a skills checklist or a, a you know, a um, nurse aide candidate handbook and they have specific steps and those specific steps you have to follow, okay? And that is uh, what they require you to do during testing because how you do things in testing and how you do things in real life are totally different, okay, totally different, all right? All right, so instructors, um, I hope this was helpful uh, for you, okay? Uh, remember, when you're setting classroom 
uh, or expectations, behavior expectations. You want to label it classroom guidelines, and not classroom rules. Okay, because remember, you throw a rule at me, I'm gonna be like, huh, how can I break that rule? And how many times can I break it before I get caught, right? But if you say classroom guidelines, that student knows that, hey, you know what? If this guideline isn't working, you know, maybe we can review it and try to modify it a little bit, okay? And remember at the beginning of this training, I told you that I like to use a democratic approach. Uh, when I create my guidelines, okay? That democratic approach, I may have, you know, five or six guidelines that I have already uh, put in place, created. And then I may ask my students, right? Being democratic, hey guys, you know, what, what, other, uh, what are other challenges or what other just, you know, things or actions or behaviors that you think would distract you from learning and gaining knowledge and a good understanding, right? What, what are your, what are those challenges, right? What guidelines would you like to see, right? And then they'll start, you know, they're gonna feel more empowered when you involve them in the creation of your guidelines. Now, again, you gonna have yours already. Right. You're going to have yours already, but engage, you know, engage or include your students to um, actually help you create the guidelines. Right. Because when you create something, you value it a little bit more than someone else creating it. Right. OK. So that's another thing. Just use a democratic approach when you um, develop your classroom guidelines, okay? No more rules, guidelines, okay? Now, that's the first element, okay, of guidelines. The second element is implementing those guidelines, right? So now you have to put those guidelines in action, okay? Um, so um, so it's, it's not just creating, but implementing, right? So now, you know, you can say, hey, you know, starting, because, um, you know, kids, even adults, they're going to be scrambling that first week. You're going to have students coming in, students leaving, you know, maybe even for the first two weeks. So what I like to do is say, okay, these guidelines are going to take effect beginning the first day of the second week. Right. And every day I'm going to um, have those guidelines um, on the projector or on my whiteboard. And we are going to first thing, um, you know, I have the students to read off those guidelines. OK, every day leading up to that um, second week. OK, first day of the second week or however, whenever you want to begin implementation of the guidelines. OK, uh, you may want to begin implementation the second day of training. That's OK. Right. Um, but you want to make sure that you have those guidelines um, posted uh, somewhere where they are visible uh, for the students to see. OK. Third, you need to enforce those guidelines, right? So if you see someone that is violating one of those guidelines, there has to be consequences, okay? There has to be consequences for that student or students, right? Um, and you can also include that in your guideline, right? So you can have, um, for an example, um, cell phone usage limited to brain break, time, right? Five minutes um, in order for, you know, the student uh, to gain, you know, knowledge and understanding of, you know, of lecture, you know, of the lecture material. And then if, you know, this guideline is violated, okay, this is the consequence, okay? One, it can be a warning, right? Uh, first violation, student gets a warning, okay? Get off your cell phone, put it away. Remember the guidelines, right? Okay, 
The second violation, phone gets placed. I, ha I have a basket, right? Okay, you, 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 I catch you on it, you dropping it, okay, in, in the basket, right? So, um, you know, second violation, your phone gets, you know, placed in the basket, right? Put it in the basket. OK, and then whatever the third, uh, you know, if you want to have a third consequence, right, third consequence, maybe at that time you're going to need a sit down uh, talk, right, with your, your with your student. And when you have a sit down talk with your student, um, you know, you don't want it to be just you and your student. You actually want to have a mediator. Right. So someone in your administration uh, can actually sit in uh, just to mediate. Um, and also be a witness as to what is being said. So there won't be any like miscommunication, right? Especially with high schoolers, right? Because they'll go back home and say something totally different than what you said, right? Or even, even adults, right? They may, you may say something and they may, you know, hear something different, right? So it's always good uh, to have a mediator, um, there with you just as a witness to the conversation, okay? All right, so three parts, three parts to developing your guidelines. Again, one, creating your guideline. Uh, two, right, that's, that's the actions or behaviors that, um, you know, you don't want, uh, you know, your students uh, exhibiting during class. Uh, two, implementation. So, you know, when are you going to implement these guidelines, right? Day two of training, day three, day four, or the first day of the second week of training, whenever you're going to start implementing, right? And then three, uh, which I think is really the most important, is enforcing. Because if you don't enforce uh, your guidelines that you develop, they're useless, right? It defeats the purpose of um, you know, developing classroom guidelines. It really does. You have to enforce it, okay? Um, all right. So um, the actual guideline, right? The actual guideline, three parts. Again, um, you know, ask yourself, what is the behavior that you do, do not want to see? But remember, you're not going to negate that behavior, Okay, because again, like I said, we as instructors, when we go to our trainings, when we go through these, uh, you know, one hour, two hour, three hour, four, five, six hour conferences, y'all know y'all be on your phone. Okay, you can't tell me you, you, you not. Okay, you get on your phone. Sometimes you walk out of the training with your phone hung on your ear. You know, you're talking to the person next to you or behind you or in front of you. So you really cannot expect to eliminate any of that with your students, whether they're high school students or adults. OK, so three parts to the actual guide. OK, so let me do this. OK, um, so classroom guidelines. Ah. Marie, Judith, thank you so much for the super chat. You are awesome. Thank you. Um, elements. Okay, so we have one is creation. Ah. Creation of guidelines. Two implementation of guidelines, and three, enforcement. That sounds a little harsh, huh? Enforcement of classroom of guidelines. I just say guidelines. Okay, so classroom guideline elements. Okay, three, your creation of guidelines, again, um, you know, your guidelines are going to be directed towards certain behaviors, right? That um, you think as an instructor that uh, your students have a high probability of exhibiting in your classroom. But we all know cell phones is the number one, right? Cell phones, the number one, okay? Now the guideline itself, Okay, so I'm going to say this, um, the guideline expectation, expectation 
um, has three variables, okay? And those variables are um, uh, the behavior, uh, behaviors or actions, okay? The behaviors or actions. And then part two of that guideline is why, okay? Why, okay? Why do you want students uh, to limit their sidebar conversation, right? Okay, and then three, uh, violation consequences. I hope I spelled that right, okay? So that's gonna show your students, your students are going to see at a glance, okay, what behaviors, um, you know, what your expectations are of behaviors that you do not want to see in your classroom, okay? Um, why, right, you do not want to see those behaviors. And if you do, this is what's gonna happen, okay? This is what's going to happen. All right. Okay. Now, last but not least, when you get your guidelines created, hi, Gabby. Gabby's here. Hi, sweetheart. What are you eating? Her mouth is all chocolate. Are you eating chocolate? This is my love of my life. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. She's eating Oreos. I can smell it. I hope you didn't eat too many. You get a tummy ache if you eat too many. Okay, so um, last but not least, right? Because I don't know about y'all, right? I don't know about y'all, but I always get. I didn't know we weren't we weren't allowed to do that, right? Well, boo! All right, we went over this like you know the first week, the second week, third week, and the fourth week. The first month of training, I've been going through these guidelines, reiterating them. But I didn't know, Ms. J. Mm, yeah, right, right. How can you eliminate that or at least diminish that miscommunication is you actually put your guidelines, your classroom guidelines on paper, okay? Um, when you give them out to the students, okay, you're going to have your students to sign and date the guidelines. Gabby, get off that door. Sign and date the guidelines. And then you are going to sign and date the guidelines. So the student is signing and dating, basically stating, I was given a copy of these guidelines. I understand these guidelines. I even put like little lines in front of them so the student can initial each guideline, okay, saying that they understand the guidelines. Then they will sign, basically saying, you know, teacher gave me a copy. I understand um, the guidelines. I understand the reasons why uh, these guidelines are set in place. <clears throat> and I understand that there are consequences to violating these guidelines, okay? And then they date it. Um, you're signing it basically to say that, you know, you set these guidelines. These are your guidelines that you set in place. Your student is, you know, says that he or she understands these guidelines and why they're set in place and the consequences that uh, may occur when there are violations to this guideline, right? And then you date it. You make a copy, you give it to the student. That second copy, you put in their student file, okay? So when they do come and say, Miss J, I did not know that, right? I didn't know we weren't allowed to chew gum, right? I, I didn't know we couldn't get on our cell phone, right? Hold on, boo. Hold on. Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. Look at this. This is actually my print page, right? My printer. I, I'm cleaning my printer uh, ribbon, right? But say, look, all these guidelines and look, this specific one, you actually initialed saying that you understand it, you signed it, and you dated it on this date. So now are you still going to tell me that I did not tell you this? Right? What's that called? What's that called, ladies and gents? 
CYA, cover your ass, right? CYA, okay? But um, yeah, so that is it, guys, for this uh, live stream, okay? And in doing so, what I wanted to tell you also was the getting your students engaged and keeping them engaged. This is how you get your students engaged, okay? Keeping engaged actually has a lot to do with you know, teaching strategies and, uh, you know, their learning, uh, your students' learning styles, okay, and how you teach and what you teach. So that's going to be a, in a video all by itself, okay? But the guidelines, your classroom guidelines is what is actually going to get your students engaged, okay? Getting your students engaged is much easier than keeping them engaged, okay? And it's gonna be much easier on you if you get these guidelines set in place, if you implement them, and if you enforce them, okay? So instructors, hmm. I am going to, let me see if this is it. Yes, um, I actually have virtual coaching Ooh. sessions for instructors. Hey, Gab Gab. <laughs> what are you doing? Your mouth is all chocolate. Her mouth is all chocolate. Um, uh-oh. I love you, too. Ah. I love you, too. All right. So, okay, what I just put in here is uh, the link for my virtual coaching sessions for uh, nurse aid instructors. And these, um, like right now, what I, I did, uh, this little, you know, I'm not going to say little, right? Because this is a lot of information, right? Um, good information for you, whether you're a novice instructor, intermediate instructor, or, a, you know, an experienced instructor, okay? But with the virtual coaching sessions for instructors, um, it's going to be geared towards your needs right, and specific to your needs. This is just general, okay? So the virtual um, live stream coaching sessions that I have um, are just general, okay? But with the general information, you can actually tweak it to make it more specific to your needs, you know, in your classroom, at your training site, for your students, okay? <laughs> but the virtual coaching sessions are gonna be more specific, okay? So if you are interested in uh, Nurse Jar coaching you, um, go ahead and book your session uh, today, okay? Uh, sessions are $75 per hour. That's much less, I think what, $60 less than what I was charging uh, you know, last year. Um, Sessions. It was $135 an hour, but I brought the price down uh, to $75 an hour. Okay, so this is the type of information we're going to talk about during, um, you know, your coaching sessions. If you need help or advice with, you know, um, PowerPoint, uh, you know, how to, you know, set up your PowerPoint presentations with information, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about it general. Uh, generally with uh, some of the live streams that I do now for instructors. Uh, if you need help with your lesson plans, um, you know, show you how to do your daily lesson plans to get you more organized. If organization is a challenge for you, right? Uh, talk to you about different interactivities that you can integrate with some of these boring lectures. Yes, some of these lectures can be very boring, but you can make it enjoyable for your students and for you as an instructor to teach with interactive activities. So, um, you know, all of that is going to be included uh, with your virtual coaching sessions. But again, it is going to be specific to your needs and your wants. I got to get ready to go, guys, because Gabby's pulling me. She needs me. Okay, baby girl, mommy's coming. All right. So, Thank you so much, Sheree. Oh, she's getting ready to close my computer. Wait, 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 wait. I know, just wait, just a second.
Okay, thank you so much for all the hearts, Cherie, and the prayers. Thank you. Again, Marie Judah, thank you so much for your super chat. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Congratulations on your class, boo. Remember, day one is when you start preparing. Okay. And remember how, you know, like when you're, you know, whether you work in a hospital or whether you work um, at a nursing rehab, right? You have staff that get really nervous when it's, we're in that survey window, get nervous. And as like the, um, the clinical nurse educator, I would always ask them, why y'all getting nervous? Like you should always be ready, right? For state survey, right? You always stay prepared for state survey. And so it's the same for your nurse aid training. Um, you should always prepare for your state exam. When do you start preparation? Day one of training. All right, day one of training. Um, I want to congratulate. Um, um, I think I have, um, I do have a video for transferring from the bed to the wheelchair, okay? So that should be on, I know it's on Pearson View and, and Credentia. Um, and the transferring, um, like with, with Prometric, no, not with Prometric, I'm sorry. Prometric, Credentia, and Pearson View are the same. With Headmaster, um, some states call it transferring. Um, others will call it ambulation from the bed to the wheelchair. So it's like you're transferring them, but you know, you're getting them up out of bed, you're ambulating them and transferring them to the bed. So um, I don't have a lot of uh, Headmaster videos I'm up because each day I'm like, what did I get myself into? Each state that is um, under headmaster has different like skills and different ways, and some of the similar skills it's like different ways they want it done. So I think it's gonna be a while before because I think headmaster has like 13 states or something like that. So it's gonna be a while for me to get through that. Um, again, Carol, uh, congratulations on passing uh, your state certification exam last April. Bree, honey, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations on passing your state uh, nurse aid certification exam. Okay, guys, uh, so there's my link. Mm. Awesome, Denzel, Yazzie, congratulations. I know that wait, that wait, that anticipation, right? After you take your exam and you're waiting to receive that email, right? On whether or not you pass. Uh, that's good, congratulations, uh, Denzel, Yazzie, awesome. I'm so glad that my videos were helpful. I, I am. I'm super glad. Super glad. I love it. I love this when subscribers come back and tell me that they have passed. I, I love it. Keep keep sending me those comments. Okay. All right, guys. So, um, oh, I got 13 likes. Yes. So if this video was helpful to you, uh, the information was good for you, um, go ahead and kick that like button, okay? Smash the subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed, well, you can't be on this live stream unless you are a subscriber because I made it for subscribers only anyway. But, um, you know, tell your friends, tell your students, tell fellow instructors um, about my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to be doing more um, live stream um, instructor coaching videos, okay? Um, this is my first one, and I'm so excited, so excited. So I hope you all enjoyed this live stream. Uh, again, it was for instructors, but students, um, good for you to know uh, what challenges we as instructors face 
when it comes to, you know, student, you know, certain student behaviors or actions that y'all be doing while we try to teach you, right? Okay. So hopefully uh, that will give you a good understanding of why sometimes we may get upset when we, you know, we're talking and teaching you and we hear you in the background holding out a full-blown conversation, right, with your classmate next to you. Um, it's only because we want you to receive, uh, you know, greater than good training. And we want you to receive that knowledge, not only knowledge, but a sound understanding of what we are teaching you. And you really can't do that if you're on your cell phone or you're chatting, you know, with uh, your classmate, okay, or doing something else, right? Okay. All right, guys, I got to go. I got to go take care of Gab Gab. She just took the entire candy dish to her room and she just got through eating Oreos. All right, guys, love you all. Mayor, uh, Marie Judah, thank you so much again for that super chat. That means a lot. I have uh, memberships on my channel now. So under each video, that little join button that's lined in blue, if you click on it, you can join a membership. Three tiers. Um, I have the, um, what is it? The investor member. Uh, you'll uh, have access to uh, members only live streams. Um, my, the second tier is the mm, elite investor. You'll have access not only to members live streams, but also access to members only video. The investor uh, membership is $2.99 a month. The elite investor membership is um, $4.99 a month. And then the inimitable um, member, inimitable investor membership is $9.99 a month. Um, you'll not only have access to members only live streams, um, not only have access to members only videos, but you will also receive priority responses from me. I will respond to you within four hours of you submitting a question, comment, or concern. You will also have um, receive early access uh, to, uh, you know, most videos that I upload um, to my YouTube channel, meaning you will see them first for an entire week before any other subscribers see them, right? So you'll be ahead of the game, right? Um, and um, another um, exclusive perk for Intermittable Instructors, the one that I'm most excited about is the virtual video collaboration that you could do with me, okay? Um, so um, go ahead if you are able to, um, you know, support my channel by joining one of those membership tiers. Uh, the higher the tier, the more exclusive perks you receive for your monthly uh, support, okay? All right, guys. Love you guys. Thank you so much for being loyal subscribers. And thanks for all of you who have been referring my channel uh, to other nurse aid students and candidates. I really appreciate you all. Ciao.